So today we're going to finish talking about uh, I.O. systems. Um, so remember last class we were mostly talking about uh, both disk scheduling and sort of various types of, of disk storage. Um, right, so we talked about a couple of different algorithms for doing disk scheduling, starting from first come first serve and then um, shorter seat time first and then the two variants of sort of the elevator approach. Uh, and then we talked about, you know, a couple of different types of mass storage, you know, magnetic hard drives, solid state drives. Um, you know, other types of archival drives like tapes, and then finally RAID arrays. Um, so today we're going to sort of, sort of, we've sort, we've basically spent so far been talking specifically about disks and file systems, right? And disks are just one type of I/O device. Um, so today we're going to basically talk about I/O devices more generally than just disks. Obviously, those are you know the the, the most useful example, um, but we're going to talk more generally about you know, how the OS manages devices in general uh, in terms of things like device drivers. Um, so we'll talk about, you know, what a device driver actually does um, and in general how you actually go about designing a device driver. So, so first of all, you know, let's recall the main components of a machine. You know, when we sort of have the, the simplified picture of our heads of what a machine is, we have, right, we have CPU, we have memory, we have I.O. devices, and then we have, you know, a system bus connecting all of those devices, right? So, you know, in general, a system bus is basically just allowing multiple devices to communicate with the CPU. And, you know, the system bus is going to be shared by lots of different devices. So, basically, in order to talk to a specific device, um, we use what's called a, a device port. And essentially, the way you can think of a device port is basically like it's, at the most basic level, it's sort of like a small set of registers um, specific to that device, right? So these are not registers in the sense of, you know, registers on the CPU. These are registers for the device itself. Um, and what we're going to have, at least in general, for, you know, sort of a basic simple device is we're basically going to have four different registers comprising, you know, what we call the device port. So... First, we're going to have basically a status register that's telling us what the device is doing, right? So if the device is doing work, then that register is going to be you know, set to a busy value. Um, or it might tell us that, you know, there is data ready to be read, right? So if you have issued some request to a device to get data and the I.O. device has completed your request, then the status register might say, you know, I have data ready. Or maybe, you know, there was some error that resulted from, you know, the last instruction it was, it was doing. Um, there'll be another register, the control register, which is basically where we can tell the I.O. device, you know, what we want it to do, right? So our two most basic commands for just about any type of I.O. device are going to be some sort of read and some sort of write. Um, there are various other types of commands we might have, but those are sort of the most basic. Uh, and then we'll have registers used to either actually send data to the device or to read data back, right? So these are, again, either, you know, one byte or one word, you know, a few bytes at most, um, you know, little pieces of data that we can actually, you know, send or receive uh, to, to the device. Uh, and then we're going to have, you know, the actual device controller. So the uh, device controller is basically a piece of hardware that's actually managing the connection from the device itself to the system bus, right? Because the bus is where data is being sent between the CPU and devices. The controller is basically providing the interface between the bus and the actual device itself. And so that's what's actually, you know, taking data from these ports and actually handing them to the device itself to actually, you know, run whatever the command is. And then, of course, we have, you know, the actual hardware device itself, right? And so, of course, the controller is basically being used so that we don't have to actually directly talk to the device itself. So, you know, lots of different types of devices we'll have, you know, traditional things like, you know, disks, printers, and keyboards, as well as any type of, you know, other more non-traditional devices would all sort of use this same basic approach of a generalized I.O. device. Now, you know, assuming a simple device that's laid out like this, where we're only basically giving it or receiving, you know, one small piece of data at a time, um, this is, of course, basically assuming that in order to read or write a lot of data, we're basically having to repeatedly update these register values, 
right? So if we, if I want to send, you know, a gigabyte of data or read a gigabyte of data from a disk, and I'm going to do it just using sort of this basic approach, then basically I'm going to have to continually issue read requests and then keep reading out data from, you know, da it, the disk will keep placing small pieces of data in the data in register, and I'll keep reading those out and just do it one small block of data at a time. Right, so obviously that's going to be pretty slow if you're doing a lot of I.O. Um, so we're going to talk later about how we can actually you know, do that more efficiently. So now let's just take a look at sort of a picture of what this, this whole layout works um, with various buses. So, um, so far we've talked about you know, the system bus as sort of the one bus. Now in practice your machine is basically going to have a number of buses. right? Because most generally a bus is just connecting multiple, multiple components. Right, so one of the most common types of buses that a machine may have to connect various devices is what we call a PCI bus. So, right, so that's basically just a standard used in many different machines to actually have devices you know, communicate over this, uh, the shared PCI bus. So each type of device that is going to talk over this PCI device bus is going to have its own controller. Right, so that's going to be the one piece of hardware that actually knows how to talk to that type of hardware. So, for example, you know, there are a couple, many different types of disks you might have, right? So, I think probably the most common disk interface today is a SATA drive. Um, but other types are things like, you know, IDE or SCSI are also different types of uh, disk controllers. So, you'll have some controller that basically knows how to speak that protocol. And then that will be connected to possibly more than one of that actual device, right? So, if you have some IDE disk controller, that's connected to the PCI bus, and that disk controller, you may have multiple IDE disks attached to that single controller. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I thought I saw you raise your hand a second ago. Um, now, we may have other buses essentially attached to something like a PCI bus, which will allow us to attach other types of devices. So essentially, everything over this bus is speaking, you know, sort of the PCI language. Um, but another type of an expansion bus might be something like USB, right? Because USB is a very, very common uh, type of device that we all have. Um, you know, we get USB devices, and I'll plug those in, and those are obviously using the USB standard. Um, but we can actually get a sense that typically the way a USB interface is working is you have some USB controller connected to the PCI bus, and that itself is providing a USB bus over which you have various USB devices. Um, so actually we can take a quick look at that. So this is the, this is the system information um, application on my Mac. And this is basically just showing you know, a list of all the various types of hardware I have on my machine. So if I go down here to you know, USB, so, so this is basically like a tree of devices, right? Because we essentially have buses connected to other devices, other controllers, which might in themselves provide further you know, buses. So here we have this USB bus. And see, this has like a PCI device ID, right? Because this is essentially, this USB bus is a controller connected to the PCI bus. And then I have you know, various types of devices you know, connected to this USB bus, right? So like my keyboard is... Obviously, on a laptop, you're not plugging your keyboard into anything, but internally, that is just connected to the USB bus, which is then connected to the PCI bus, which is then essentially connected to the CPU. So, you know, I already mentioned many different types of disk controllers. Um, so, now in practice, uh, essentially, we're not showing all the different types of buses here, but to actually say, for example, we want to go from the CPU down to, say, a mouse or a keyboard, which are a USB device, and actually you know, do that I.O. all the way. Um, in order to actually go from the CPU, typically right, we're starting from the CPU, and then the CPU is communicating over normally we call the front side bus. Right, so that's basically like your, your main a system bus connected directly to the CPU. And then this is going to be connected to the PCI controller, which is going to be connected to you know, PCI bus, down to USB controller, and then a USB bus, and finally all the way down to a device. Right? So essentially, your whole machine is 
arranged like this big hierarchical tree of buses, controllers, and devices. And in some cases, you essentially have these daisy chains of devices. But essentially, the main thing to keep in mind here is that you know, the controller is basically a piece of hardware that's allowing you to connect um, you know, the, the types of devices that that controller knows how to talk to. So this is sort of how it looks like from an architectural standpoint of your actual hardware. Um, now, you know, the picture is a little bit different when we're talking about how it looks you know, from the OS's perspective. So essentially, this picture is showing us what it looks like to the OS. So, of course, down here at the bottom, you have your actual hardware, right? You have, you know, disks, keyboard, mouse, all of your hardware devices. And then you have your hardware controllers that are talking directly to the devices. And that's essentially the hardware piece of it. And then up on top of that, you have the actual software. All right, so basically, the lowest piece of software in your OS are your device drivers. Right? So device drivers are basically you know, pieces of code inside your kernel that know how to talk to the device controllers. Right? So that's basically the lowest software piece. And then there's basically a common subsystem for interacting with, with all different types of device drivers. And then you know, above that is obviously every, all, all the other parts of your software that ultimately are going to be filtered down through your device drivers. So basically, the job of the device driver is to know, you know, what commands do my de what what commands do does a given uh, device controller actually understand, right? Because different types of I/O devices might have different sets of commands, and commands might mean different things. So when you write your device driver, you're basically writing your device driver to handle all the different types of commands that your controller can actually do something with. And that might even be different for two different types of the same type of device, right? So you could have two different keyboards that actually have different commands, right? Because some keyboards are very, very simple, just have keys. Some keyboards have, you know, a lot of sort of extra functionality. Um, and that sort of extra functionality might have to be supported by a different device driver, right? Because when you go and buy, you know, a, a uh, you know, complicated mouse or a keyboard, often there's some piece of software that you have to install in order to be able to use all the you know, special functionality of that device. Right? So typically what you're doing there is you're, they're basically giving you the device driver that knows how to talk to that specific device and deal with all of its functionality. So when we're actually communicating over you know, some kind of a system bus or a PCI bus or whatnot, right, that's basically a broadcast medium. Right, so when you send a command over the bus, it's basically just being sent to every device on the bus. And of course, when you're doing that, you actually want to be talking to some specific device on the bus, not everyone. Um, so essentially, in order to identify you know, where a specific command is going, we're basically going to give each port basically has an address. Right, so your machine basically has almost like a, a, another space of addresses identifying I.O. devices. Um, and these are basically hard-coded into your machine. Um, like Intel has a basically preset list of device uh, port locations specifying where you can talk to specific devices. So when you want to talk to a specific device, you can basically look, use its I.O. address uh, port location, send a command there, and every device controller is basically listening on your bus for its specific address. And when it finds a command that was sent to its address, it knows to actually take and run that command. And of course, other commands that it's also receiving over the bus, it's just going to ignore. <clears throat> so now let's talk about you know, what are the kinds of things that the OS is providing for I.O. devices. Um, so you know, port numbers are basically a really low-level way that we can access devices. Um, but in practice, you know, you as a programmer don't really ever use that sort of thing. Um, so one of the very nice things that most modern OSs provide is much nicer naming for um, devices. So for example, on Unix, uh, basically devices are given to you as through the file system. There's basically an interface through the file system where there are special files representing that device that allow you to read and write to those actual devices. Uh, so let's look at a, an example of that. So basically on any type of a, a, a 
Unix style system, you basically have this directory slash dev. And in here there's you know a whole bunch of whole bunch of different files. But basically all of these files are referring to certain types of I.O. devices. So for example, there's basically a bunch of files here called you know disk zero, disk one, disk two. These are basically actual hardware disks I have connected to this machine. Right? So basically there's you know, disk zero, disk one, and disk two. Actually, there is a disk three as well. There are basically four physical disks I have connected to my machine. And you could actually read and write directly to these files, and that would be reading and writing directly to the devices. Right? So this is basically just a nice little abstraction that's being provided by the OS that rather than having to work with IO devices at a much lower level, you can basically just do everything through the file system because right, we all know it's very easy to read or write to a file. And the OS is just internally going to perform the translation of, you know, when I read or write to this file, I'm actually going to take it and map it onto the disk. Um, and actually, uh, just to give you a sense of, of these, why there are all these different types of files. Um, so uh, a term I'm sure many of you are familiar with are, are partitions. Right, so when you take a disk, typically what you do is you uh, partition it into multiple pieces. So basically this just means splitting up your disk, right? So if this is your hard disk, oftentimes you basically just take it and you know, split it up into multiple pieces, right? So this might be you know, the first partition, your know, second partition, so on and so forth. And these are basically just fixed chunks of your disk. And essentially, you know, that's what I have here on my machine. I have a bunch of different partitions of my disk which have these you know, specific names in the file system. Right? So like I have a couple of partitions used for backups. And each of these partitions is actually being mapped to one of these files in the file system. Right? So essentially the format being used here is, you know, this is, this is my first physical connected disk. That's the actual raw disk. So if I just started writing to that, I'm basically just writing directly to the raw bits of the disk. Um, obviously, as you might expect, I don't recommend doing that because if you do that, you will probably mess up something with your file system. But, um, and then here we have essentially, you know, this is basically the first partition of the disk, you know, second partition of the disk, so on and so forth. Right, so this is just taking essentially the logical disk layout and laying it out in this nice simple way um, that, that makes it much easier to work with. So, you know, naming is one thing that the OS does for us. Um, you know, access control obviously is another one. Um, you know, if we, I didn't show the permissions on those files, but certain types of those files may let you do sensitive things. Um, so, for example, I think this may not be the case in current versions of Linux, but on older versions of Linux, there was basically a file in slash dev called slash dev slash mem. And any guesses as to what that was actually letting you do? Yeah. Right. It was basically this, this file lets you write directly to main memory, kind of in, in any way you want. So obviously that was not something that sort of any application could just say, you know, open up slash dev slash mem and start writing all over the place. So, you know, the OS is obviously protecting access to your I.O. devices. Um, you know, other things like buffering and caching, um, which are, you know, largely things provided for better performance. We'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, and you know, also, you know, I/O scheduling. I, I think I mentioned this last class, but uh, you know, the actual scheduling going on could be going on within the controller itself, right? Which is basically outside the control of your OS. When you actually get the piece of hardware, you get the controller as part of that, and the controller may be doing I/O scheduling, or the device driver itself may be doing I/O scheduling, right? So for some of those, you know, disk scheduling algorithms we talked about, it might be the case that the device driver is much simpler and is basically just saying do these reads and writes and the disk will go off and schedule it in some way. Or the device driver itself inside the OS might be taking those requests, scheduling them before sending them off to the controller, and then the controller will basically just you know, execute them in the order you give. Right? So you know, different, different ways in which we could actually do uh, I.O. scheduling. And then, you know, other things like error handling and you know, error and failure handling, which are, you know, the types of things that need to be dealt with somewhere, often your OS will just handle that for you so that 
you know, you aren't constantly having to do all kinds of, you know, error checks all over the place. So those are sort of the types of things that we, you know, get in our device drivers. Um, now let's sort of consider, a, you know, very generally how we actually implement device drivers. So basically the simplest possible way we can implement a device driver is using polling. Right, so the idea here is that when we want to send some command to a device, you know, if the device is already working, we're basically just going to wait until it's idle. So remember, we have that status, you know, register, which basically says whether the device is idle or busy doing something. So we can essentially just, you know, busy wait, keep checking the status until the device is idle. And then we can, you know, set the command register to some value. Right, and so this will be, again, that the command register can accept, you know, the, the values of the command register will mean something to that specific device, and the device driver knows what all those values are. So the device, uh, the, uh, the device driver will write the correct value into the command register, and if you're sending data to the device, you'll also put some data into the data out register, and then you'll basically set a status saying, you know, basically go ahead and run this command using the current value in the command register and the current value in the data out register if you're, you know, sending some, sending some data. And so then the controller is basically going to take that data, run the command, and, you know, while that's happening, obviously that may take some time, right? I.O. devices are typically very slow. So you're going to execute that command, and then once the command is done, you will, you know, the controller will set the status register back to idle. And the CPU is basically constantly checking the value of that status. Once it sees that the device is done, you can actually read the data if you're expecting data back. Now, obviously, you know, what's, what's the downside of doing it this, you know, very simple way? So what's the problem with this, with this polling approach? Yeah. Right, right, we're doing busy waiting again here, right? We're basically saying, I'm going to keep checking until the device is done, and then keep checking until, or keep checking until the device is idle, then run my command and keep checking until the device is done, and then return the data, right? And, you know, that may be okay if the I.O. device is very, very fast, but typically, you know, it may take a much, you know, a, a comparatively very long time for your command to actually complete, so you're wasting time doing that, right? So that's essentially, you know, what happens if the device is slow compared to the CPU? You spend a lot of time wasting CPU cycles waiting for your I.O. command to complete. And, right, this is particularly a problem when we're basically reading and writing very small bits of data, right? So if you're potentially having to do that lots and lots of times, then you're incurring this overhead every single time you want to go, you know, read or write potentially, you know, a single byte of data from your I.O. device. Right, so that's, that's going to add up potentially to, you know, a lot of overhead. So, you know, obviously, basically two, two limitations we've addressed here. Um, you know, the first one is basically we don't want to do a lot of busy waiting. And the second one is, obviously, in many cases, we want to be doing a lot of reads and writes. We don't want to have to just do it one byte at a time. So, basically, in order to address, you know, the first issue of busy waiting... Right, we're going to use the idea of interrupts, right, which we've seen several times before. So, you know, rather than just waiting for the device to finish and continually checking, we can basically just issue the command, go do something else, and then once the device is done, it's going to interrupt the CPU, which will tell us that the device is done and we can go fetch the data. Right, so basically the idea is that now we're going to, you know, the device driver is going to initiate some I.O., and then go off and do something else, the device, you know, controller will execute that command while the CPU is doing something else. And then once it's finished, we're going to generate some interrupt, which the CPU is going to get, and then actually get the data and return it. And we can just repeat that process, and there we don't actually have to, you know, do any, do any busy waiting. So basically, this is how, you know, most device drivers are operating. Um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of variations among device drivers, but essentially the main picture of how they're all working is, uh, almost all of them are working, is basically an interrupt-driven approach. Right, and so this is sort of, right, this is essentially the idea of doing, 
you know, asynchronous I.O. rather than synchronous I.O. where you're having to wait for everything to finish before you can continue doing something else. Now, you know, just to refresh our memory, you know, whenever we're getting, you know, one of these interrupts, they're signaling, signaling that, you know, something has happened, right? So every interrupt has some um, unique ID. Um, now, you may remember from, you know, much earlier in the course, we had this idea of a trap vector, which was essentially the same idea. Um, now, you know, one, one important thing to regard here with terminology is that we've used a few different terms. So we've used, right, we've heard the term, you know, trap and interrupt, and we've sort of been using them kind of in the same way. Um, but basically, a trap is basically an exception that's happening in a user process, right? So for example, if your process tries to do something like a division by zero or an invalid memory access or system call, right? Those are all basically raising an interrupt. Those are what we essentially call traps. But those are basically caused by your program executing versus essentially hardware interrupts, which is what we're talking about now, you know, something like when an I.O. device completes, that generates an interrupt, but that's happening asynchronously, right? Because that could essentially happen at any time, regardless of what the CPU is doing. So, you know, sometimes we, we essentially make the distinction by saying that a trap is basically a software interrupt, whereas I.O. devices are using hardware interrupts, right? Because that's essentially the difference is one of them, you know, the software interrupt is basically a synchronous interrupt, and the hardware interrupt is asynchronous. But essentially, your system is going to have you know, a big table for all of these different types of interrupts. And this is basically going to be used both for you know, software and hardware interrupts as well. So you know, that interrupts basically address the issue of having to do busy waiting. Right? And the second issue was that we also want to be able to transfer you know, more than one byte at a time. Right? Because if we're using something like a disk, we typically want to read or write a lot of data at once, so we don't want to have the CPU continuing to you know, fetch one byte at a time and do that you know, millions of times, potentially. That'll be, that'll be very expensive. So in order to address this, we're going to use this idea of direct memory access. So here we're basically going to add another type of controller to our hardware that we're going to call the DMA controller. And Basically, the idea is that the DMA controller is going to be able to function essentially as a stand-in for your CPU while the device is doing I.O. So, you know, in the, in the basic case we talked about earlier, you basically just say, you know, give me the one piece of data, and then the device does that and then waits for the CPU to come get it and issue the next command. Now we're basically just going to say, we're, the, the DMA controller, we're basically going to hand it an address in memory. And it, we're basically going to say, go read the data from this address or write the data into this address. And that could be a very large span, right? Could you, you could basically say, you know, go read 10 megabytes and store them into this memory address, right? So you're basically giving it sort of like a bulk I.O. operation. And then the DMA controller is actually going to go and operate the bus and talk to the device controller to actually do all of those IOs. And so it's going to be continuously essentially reading the data and storing it into the address that you gave it. But then from that point on, the CPU is essentially doing nothing. Right? So the CPU is telling the DMA controller, this is the address to use. Go do this read or write operation. And then the CPU is done. And then the DMA controller is going and doing all of that those I.O. operations. The CPU is off doing something else. And then once the entire transfer is done, the DMA controller is going to raise an interrupt saying, you know, your transfer is finished. And then, of course, the data that was all read is sitting in that address that the, you know, the uh, CPU gave to the DMA controller. Right? So that's, that's essentially very nice. You're just saying, here's where I want all of my data to be stored. Go do it. And then sometime later, you'll come back and it'll all be there, and the CPU you know, won't have to do anything else in the meantime. So you know, DMA is basically used for just about every device in your machine where bandwidth is a concern. Right? So anything like you know, a disk or a graphics card is using DMA because those, are, you know, those types of devices are typically doing very high bandwidth operations where do, involving the CPU on every single byte is you know, going to be very, very expensive. Now, 
Uh, one thing to note here is that, you know, again, this data is still all being transferred over the system bus, right? Because you still are ultimately having to transfer data from the I.O. device controller up to main memory somewhere. And so essentially now what you have is the DMA controller and the CPU are both sharing the same, the same, the same bus to actually transfer data from memory. Um, so that actually can sometimes slow down your CPU because essentially when the DMA controller is accessing main memory, the CPU can't be accessing main memory at the exact same time. Right, because essentially the, you know, the bus can only be used by one device at a time. Now you essentially have competition for that. So that does you know, potentially slow down the CPU, but still in general this is going to give you much better performance than having the CPU you know, do everything. And potentially you can also have multiple devices all trying to do DMA at the same time. Because right? it's not just like you, know, you have one disk and that's it. You could have multiple disks or you know, your disk or your graphics card are operating at the same time trying to do DMA. So there's always going to be some contention to use the bus to talk to memory. But this is still overall going to be a, a significant performance enhancement. So you know, this is basically just a picture of the DMA process where you know, the CPU is basically says here's the address, some address X I want to use. We're going to, you know, pass that to the controller. The controller is going to, you know, initiate a DMA transfer. At this point, the CPU is done. The disk controller is basically reading every byte. You know, what we previously were having to do with the CPU, now the DMA controller is handling everything. Once we've essentially read all of the bytes we want, we just raise an interrupt, and then we're finally going to, you know, return to the CPU. Um, now, one thing I actually did want to mention was. Um, so remember we also had this idea of memory mapped I.O., which we talked about quite a while ago. Um, so essentially the main, big difference between memory mapped I.O. and direct memory access is that in memory mapped I.O., that's basically where we're taking a subset of memory, a physical memory, and basically treating that as if it's the memory of the device itself. Right? So essentially uh, if we have something like a video card, Right, that has you know a buffer of a buffer of memory being used to store you know the pixels of the screen. Essentially, with memory map I/O, we're taking some slice of physical memory, and whenever we read or write to that, it's as if that then what's happening is we're actually taking that and reading or writing directly to you know the video, the, the graphics card, right? Which is nice and convenient, but that's still actually involving the CPU to do that. Right, so memory mapped I.O., I mean, sorry, direct memory access is basically where we're taking the CPU directly out of the equation, letting the DMA controller do everything in order to you know, free the CPU up for other work. So actually, typically, in order to talk to those port registers, oftentimes what's actually done, um, rather than do that thing with the port addresses where you say, you know, go talk to this specific I.O. address and read or write those registers, Often what's typically done is you'll use memory mapped I.O. to basically say, use this memory address as those register values, right? And that, again, makes, makes your life much easier when you're just having to, you know, it looks to you like you're just reading and writing regular memory, even though you're actually talking to, you know, the, the I.O. device when you're doing that. So... Now let's talk about I.O. devices you know, from the perspective of the application programmer. Right, because essentially the OS is you know, providing a much higher level interface to devices that you know, makes our lives easier. Um, so essentially we can consider the various characteristics of a specific device. Right? And these, these of course may vary from device to device. Um, so we basically have two different broad types of devices, broad classes. We have what we call uh, character devices and block devices. And essentially that refers to the basic unit of I.O. when you're talking to that I.O. device. Right? So obviously a character is basically a you know, small piece of data, whereas a block is you know, potentially many, many bytes of data. Right? So obviously you know, the, sort of the standard example of a, 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 a block device would be something like a disk, right? where you're reading and writing blocks of data. Anyone have any idea of what might be an example of a character device? Yeah. Right. A keyboard is a good example of a character device, right? Where you're essentially, all you have are keystrokes, right? So you're basically reading one keystroke at a time. That's essentially the, the basic unit of data. That's essentially just a character. 
right? So a keyboard is a good example of a character device. Um, and other, you know, simple devices, um, things like a mouse would be a character device as well. Um, now, we can actually also see block and character devices um, in that directory I mentioned, so if we're in slash dev. So if I do an ls-l to see all the devices here, we see that, you know, one of the attributes here is this first character is either a C or a B, which basically indicates whether this is a character or a block level device. Right, so as you might expect, when we're looking at uh, actual disks, right, all of those are block level devices, um, but certain other types of devices might be characters in here. Um, so I'm not sure what, what a lot of these correspond to. Um, and obviously not, not, obviously not every device in your system is actually going to have a file in here. Um, but you know, there's a mix of different character and block level devices. So, you know, also we can consider, you know, how we can access our devices, right? So we've been talking mostly about disk so far, which you obviously can access either in, you know, sequential or random access, right? Other types of devices are essentially just sequential, right? So if you have a keyboard, for example, right, there's essentially no sense of random access with a keyboard. You're typing things on a keyboard and you're just reading the data out sequentially, right? And that's the only form of access to a keyboard. And other types of devices, right, if you have something like a tape drive, you know, that is also going to be, you know, sequential access. You can't really do random access on a device like that. Um, something like a graphics card as well would be, you know, random access because there are, you know, various parts of the, you know, display you could update. Yeah. Um, so, would a, a true character block? Um, I'm not familiar with touchscreen specifically. I mean, in one sense, right, I mean, all a touchscreen is is you are getting some location on it, right, and it's registering a touch on some location. Um, I don't know if more advanced touchscreens maintain, I don't know, maybe you can tell me the other type of information that you get from a touchscreen. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's possible if you're getting other types of information from a touchscreen, maybe they might be, you know, a, a, a four bubble device. Um, but again, you know, these are essentially just referring to how we actually talk to the device. So it could be the case that, you know, one type of a device is one and another type of a device is, you know, a character or a block or, or whatnot. You could, have, you could have a mix potentially. Um, so, you know, and we already talked about, you know, we can have synchronous or asynchronous devices, um, right? And asynchronous is where you issue some call to a device and you're basically waiting until it finishes. Asynchronous, you're issuing a device and some time later it's going to actually come back and say it's finished, right? And in general, almost all devices nowadays are asynchronous for performance reasons. Um, you still sometimes find in like things like very low embedded systems, you might still have synchronous devices, right? Because if you have a system that is maybe based around some specific I.O. device and the CPU has nothing to do except work with that one I.O. device, maybe synchronous is fine. But in almost all cases, right, we have other things that we want our machine CPUs to be able to do rather than just talk to, you know, I.O. devices. So pretty much everything is asynchronous nowadays. Um, you know, certain types of devices could be either, right, shareable or dedicated, you know, referring to, you know, how many processes could be using the device at once, right? So something like a disk is obviously shareable because you have a lot of processes with lots of open files you know, potentially all on the same disk, that's fine. Basically, everything is, you know, sharing that one disk. But you could have certain types of devices that are basically, you know, restricted to, you know, one process that's using them at once. Right, so like something like a printer, right? A printer is basically not a shareable device. You can't have multiple things trying to print to a printer all at once. You essentially are having to print one thing and then wait, finish that, and then move on to something else. Um, now, of course, you know, devices are going to vary in how fast you can actually read and write to them, um, right? In general, as we know, most I.O. devices are going to be very slow. Um, you know, in the, in the span of, in the uh, range of I.O. devices, a disk is actually a fairly fast I.O. device. A graphics card is another example of a very fast device. Um, but many I.O. devices are basically only doing input or output at the rates of possibly bytes per second, right? So something like a keyboard as you might expect, is an extremely low-speed device, 
right? Because there's no, there's, you know, you don't have to be transferring, you know, megabytes of data to or from your keyboard. That's a very, very low bandwidth device. Um, and this is an old term, but, you know, when you talk about modems, often you hear the term baud, right? So you have your modem is 9600 baud or whatnot. And that essentially refers to the rate at which the modem can actually send or receive data. Um, and, you know, some I.O. devices might only perform input or output. Obviously, some can perform both, like a disk where you read and write, right? But many types of devices are only, you know, going to be one or the other, right? So, for example, um, you know, a graphics card is basically, you know, write only, right? You send data to your graphics card and display it, but you're essentially not getting anything back, right? And so many devices are like that as well, um, right? So, like, a keyboard is input only. Right, you're never re you're never essentially getting data back. You're just sending data to your keyboard. So you know this this table essentially shows you know a, a couple of different examples of the you know, various characteristics of device. But this basically just gives you a sense you know very large variety of devices and how we work with them. You know how we can do I O. You know how fast they are. All of these various things vary from device to device. But, you know, through all of them, we're using basically the same basic approach of, you know, some small set of commands with a uh, device controller talking to a device driver. Um, so just a little bit more about uh, block and character devices. Um, you know, so I already mentioned that block devices include, you know, disk drives. Um, so, you know, the types of commands we have, obviously, reads and writes would be the basic ones. But we're also going to have, you know, potentially other types of commands. You know, so for a disk, we're going to have something like a seek command. Um, and, you know, we can have essentially arbitrary commands for a specific device. Um, so typically when you're writing a device driver, right, to talk to an actual device, you can basically send arbitrary commands. And as long as your device driver and your device controller are essentially speaking the same set of commands, then, then essentially any, any type of command is, is possibly doable. Um, now, obviously, we can, you know, when we're talking about file systems, we could... We're usually talking to the block devices through the abstraction of a file system. That, again, is not necessarily the case. Right? As I mentioned, we can pull up those files that are essentially the raw I.O., you know, the, the raw bytes of a disk and can actually read and write from that. Obviously, in most cases, what we get back won't make a lot of sense because we're used to working through the file system. But, you know, you can do that. And then we, you know, have talked about doing things like memory mapping files. Um, you know, character devices are typically much simpler, you know, things like a keyboard or a mouse, where typically all you're basically doing is you're getting, you know, a, a character from the device or you're sending a, you know, put would be the equivalent of write. You're basically writing some character to the device. Um, now, you know, in general, you're going to have some libraries layered on top that are going to give you some extra functionality, right? So as you're typing things in a keyboard and, you know, characters are appearing on your screen, when you do something like hit backspace, you essentially have some library sitting on top of everything that is keeping some buffer of what you typed, and that's going to know to actually delete the last character you wrote. Right? Your keyboard essentially has no sense of that. Your keyboard is just saying, you know, backspace was pressed. Um, now let's talk a little bit about uh, I.O. buffering. Um, right? So I.O. devices are have basically some buffer memory where they're you know, storing data before they're actually being transferred to and from the CPU, right? So for example, let's consider, you know, the case of a disk, right? So if you have an application that, say, opens up a file and reads one byte from the file, right? So if we think about what the disk is actually doing, right, we're basically going through the whole process of we're going to send a command, you know, to the device driver. The device driver is going to talk to the disk controller. We're going to, you know, start the DMA controller and... We're going to read, how much are we going to read? Even if we only want to read one byte, how much are we actually going to read? Yeah. Right, we're going to, right, we're going to at least read one sector, right? Because that's how the disk I.O. device is actually working, right? It does read or writes at the level of sectors, right? So we're obviously reading that sector and storing it somewhere into a buffer. And then, you know, once we're finished... Maybe we, you know, only go and get that one byte, but we've still read that whole, you know, block into a buffer. So, you know, let's consider a few reasons for, you know, why we're actually doing this. 
Um, so, you know, one reason we're doing this is to cope with speed mismatches between devices, right? So, for example, let's say that you're receiving data, you're receiving a file over a network, and you want to write that to the disk, right? So, your disk and your network interface are going to be running at different speeds, most likely. And typically, your network is going to be running much, much slower, right? Maybe you're only receiving, you know, one megabyte per second over the network, but your disk can be writing, you know, 100 megabytes per second, for example, right? So, essentially, what we're doing here with buffering is we're receiving the data over the network and just filling up some buffer of data without having to talk to the CPU. And then once we've actually filled up the buffer, then we can basically go say, you know, tell the CPU, here's a buffer of data, go write that out, right? And that's going to be more efficient because if we didn't have that, we would essentially have to be, you know, repeatedly writing very small pieces of data, right? Because if you're getting very small pieces of data repeatedly and having to write them out to disk immediately, then either you are constantly issuing I.O. requests from the CPU or you're basically sitting around with your, you know, network unable to receive any more data because it's waiting on the CPU to come get the data it already has. Right, so essentially buffering there is allowing us to cope with these speed mismatches. Um, it can also let us deal with the fact that we might have different data transfer sizes. Right, so also when you are transferring data over a network, right, we're talking about packets. Right, because when you send data over a network, there's basically some maximum packet size that specifies the, you know, the unit size, the amount of data you can send over the network at once is a single packet. And oftentimes, you, if you're sending something like a large file, that's going to be larger than a packet size. So you're essentially getting all of these bunches of packets, and what you're basically doing is reassembling them in the buffer. And then once you've essentially reassembled them, then you can actually you know, pass them to the CPU saying, here's you know, the reassembled file from all of the, from all of the different packets. Right, so that's you know sort of the, the opposite of the disk case, um, and then of course we want to you know minimize wasted time. We don't want to be you know sitting around blocked on a write. So when we're typically doing a write, what we're, what's going to happen is we're going to write data to a buffer, and then return to the user program immediately, and then we're actually not going to do the I/O until later. So this actually gets to the next idea, which is this idea of caching. Right, so right, we all know essentially what a cache is. We're going to basically work with a cache which is much faster than sort of what the underlying data store is. And that's going to let us improve performance. Right, so in the case of disks, what we want to basically do is improve performance by accessing the disk a fewer number of times. Right, so we already talked about, you know, the, the main idea here is when you are, you know, doing disk I.O., we're going to read more data than you actually requested. And then you're going to basically just store that in memory, and you're, you know, that's an in-memory cache. And then when we actually are doing reads and writes, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just look to see if we have it in the cache. And if we do have that data in the cache, we can just handle it immediately without doing any disk I.O. Right, so you can actually do a very simple test of this yourself. If you say write an application that opens a file and reads one byte of it, and then reads a second byte of it, and you time both of those operations, the second one is going to be much, much faster than the first one because of caching, you're not actually doing any I.O. in the second one. Right, so essentially last class we, and the class before, we basically sort of assumed that whenever you say read or write, you're actually doing some I.O. In many cases, it's not actually going to be the case, you know, due to using caching. Now, the issues we need to actually deal with when we're talking about caching is, you know, one is um, how to do cache replacement, right? So obviously the idea here is that your cache is some finite value. You need to decide, you know, how to throw things out. Um, but we also have this idea of uh, write through versus write back. Is that a term that any of you have heard from 2.30? I'm not sure if they cover, they cover that. Okay. Well, okay. Um, so... Basically, right, the idea in write through and write back is, you know, what happens when we actually write to a cache, right? Because a cache is basically used as a substitute for some, you know, much slower backing store, right? So if we're talking about a disk and we have some in-memory cache, then, you know, what we have is, you know, we have, you know, the disk, which is very, very slow, and then we have some memory, 
which is much faster. And you know, the, the CPU up here, ideally you want to be working with you know, the in-memory copy of something rather than the, you know, that's obviously going to ultimately be stored you know, somewhere on the disk. Right, so the question is, what happens when we write to a cache? Right, so with a write-through policy, basically what that means is that, let's say I update this piece of data. Right, and this is basically the in-memory cache for some, say, file that's sitting on the disk. Right, so with write-through, what we're going to do is we're going to immediately take that update and copy it back to the disk. As opposed to a write-back policy, we're basically going to write to the in-memory cache and then basically just say we're done. And then at some time later, of course, we actually are going to write back to the copy on disk. Right, so what's the advantage of using a write-through policy? Or rather, what may, what's, what may be a disadvantage of using a write-back policy? So what could happen if you don't update this copy immediately? <coughs> the copy that's sitting on disk. Yeah. Right, you could potentially lose it. Right, if you are working with some file and you update it, and you update the you know, cached memory cop copy, and then your system loses power. Right? This copy has not been updated, but memory is not persistent. Right? So if your machine has to be rebooted for some reason, your machine crashes, you lose power, you essentially have lost that update. Right? So the main advantage of write through is that basically as soon as you've completed that write, it's, you know, it's, it's essentially you've saved the data. It's, you know, it's, it's more reliable or safer in that you can't actually lose the data because the, you know, the underlying copy has been updated. But you know what's the what's the disadvantage of having to do of doing write through? Yeah. Right. So write through is going to be really really slow potentially, right? Because if I am updating this copy, and if I do a write to this piece of data, and I have to wait for the copy on disk to be updated, right? That's going to be a very very slow operation, right? Because the entire point of using the cached copy is that that's sitting in memory much, much faster than anything having to do with the actual disk. Right, so if I just, if I'm using a write back policy, I can basically just update that and say, okay, I'm done. And that's going to appear as your application is running that it's running much faster. Right, because you're not having to wait for all these I.O. requests. So you'll have this copy that's different from the copy on disk, and at some point, you'll write it back. Now, assuming nothing bad happens, Right, at some point that will actually happen and you won't notice that essentially you had this difference. Question? Yeah, is that what you could use memory map IO? Or map the cache to um potentially. Um I mean your OS could basically be using an in-memory cache, and that's essentially uh, separate from the issue of when you're writing it back to the disk. Right? Because you could have your OS and basically say, map this piece of memory to some file. And when I write to it, Right, you could consider either using a write through or a write back call. So you could say, when I write to this data, I'm actually going to go to the disk immediately and write it out, in which case you'll have to wait. Or your OS could basically say, okay, I'll write here, but I'm actually just going to write it out sometime later. I'll just return immediately. Right, so you could consider potentially either a write through or a write back policy with something like a, you know, a file mapped into memory. Does that make sense? Because right, essentially that's just basically used as an abstraction for you know, how you talk to the file, or how you talk to the disk, right, using some standard memory address addresses. But how it actually gets back onto the disk is again going to be an issue of you know, what, we're, what potentially the OS is deciding to do. Yes? So do OS is the default I mean, just like one, with like one OS switch between you could potentially do that. Um, so basically, originally, like many, many years ago, uh, most systems used a write-through policy, you know, thinking that you know, obviously re reliability is really important. We don't want to lose data, so we'll do a write-through policy. Um, but nowadays, pretty much almost all OSs are using a write-back policy, um, you know, figuring that performance is more important. Because right? obviously, in almost all cases, right, this is going to be fine. Right, because you are not expecting your computer to crash every so often or to lose power every so often. Right, I mean that will happen once in a while, but you know probably 99.9% .9 of the time, 
everything is going to be fine with a write back policy. And every time you're you know, writing to the cache, you're getting a very significant speed up from not having to you know, wait for the disk. So you know, typically a write back is, is what's used in almost all cases nowadays. <coughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm sure that most OSs probably give you the ability to turn it up before. So um, this is actually, and actually, there's there's another benefit of write back for write back uh, policy in terms of total system performance, right? So we've sort of been talking about at the level of your process, which is issuing writes to a cached copy, and with a write back policy, you're essentially getting control back immediately and can continue running. Um, obviously, from the perspective of the I.O. device, you're still doing the same things. You're still going to have to do the write at some point. Right? But one other extra advantage of doing write back is essentially that you can do batching of your, your writes. Right? So if you are issuing a whole bunch of small writes right, to a file, say, let's say you're writing one byte at a time. So let's say that you know you write a program that just has a for loop and writes one byte of the file, you know, a thousand times, right? If you have a write through policy, you're actually doing that. You're saying write one byte, go and do it. Once it's finished, write another byte, go and do that I/O, right? That's going to be potentially very slow. You're going to have to do a thousand I/O operations. Whereas with the write back, you can basically just issue all of those immediately, and then the OS can essentially say, okay, I have these, you know, thousand I/Os to the same file. Obviously, I'm just going to write that out in one block, right? So that's basically the idea of batching, where you can potentially make very, you know, lots of very small writes, just batch them up, and you know, write them out as one single larger write. So that's you know another uh, benefit for the entire system, not just for the one process that's potentially having to wait. <clears throat> now, also, actually, I should mention, you know, this idea is actually true for. Uh, just about any types of caching we do, right? So this is sort of one example where we have a disk as a backing store and we have, you know, a memory cache and then the CPU, right? But our systems have lots of different types of caches, right? So um, in one of the earlier lectures, we had a, we had a picture of, of, you know, like a, a cache hierarchy, where we have something like, you know, CPU and then you have, you know, an L1 cache and an L2 cache, possibly an L3 cache, you know, main memory down here, you know, so on and so forth. There are lots of different levels of caching. So this is actually a question that comes up basically in the context of any types of caching. Of basically, do you want to push down updates all the way through the cache hierarchy or just stay up at the top where you're going to get the best performance? Right, so here we're talking in the context of what to do with, you know, a, a, a disk. But that's basically more generally true for, for all different types of caches. So, you know, just to pull back and give ourselves, you know, the big picture again of, you know, say how a typical read call is going to work, right? So we're going to issue some read requests from a device. And before we actually go and do any I.O., we're going to check to see if we have it in a buffer, right? So if we don't have it, if we do have it in the buffer, we're done. We just give it to the CPU immediately and nothing else to do. If we don't have it in the buffer, then we actually have to go through the whole process of, you know, we talk to the device driver, the device driver talks to the controller, and then we actually start doing the transfer and we get an interrupt when it's finished. But in many cases, we're not having to do you know, any of that. And then you know, once we actually have the data, then we get an interrupt and the, you know, the process gets back in the ready queue, ready to take the data that was sent and continue execution. Right, so I won't go through this in detail, but this is basically just the, the picture of, of how that's working, where you know, up here, we, all the way at the top, we have the user process. Down at the bottom, we have the device controller talking to the device. And you know, in general, what we want to do most of the time is basically short circuit all of this if we can satisfy it immediately using data in the buffers or caches. And only if not are we going to go down through you know, the kernel, the device driver, interrupt handler, all the way down to the device, you know, the device itself. And then obviously, you know, back up all the way to the process. Um, so, you know, this is, this is in the textbook, so don't worry too much about the figure. So, you know, basically, summarize what we've talked about. You know, I.O. is obviously very, very expensive. 
Um, so most of this is, you know, a lot of this in large part is talking about how we can make very, very slow I.O. devices work efficiently with a much, you know, faster main memory and CPU. Right, and so in terms of how we actually I implement these, you know, typically we're using an interrupt-based approach. Um, and then various things we can do to improve performance, um, you know, things like caching or, you know, merging smaller data transfers into large data transfers um, using, and using DMA to, you know, offload work from the CPU. 